This is Kimalu, a 12-year-old beluga whale born at Chicago's Shedd Aquarium, and she just became the first ever beluga to recover from general anesthesia after an unprecedented surgical procedure. Whales and dolphins have unique biological adaptations that made general anesthesia impossible until now. This incredible medical breakthrough not only provided Kimalu with relief and a better quality of life, but it has the potential to help whales and dolphins worldwide. Shed Aquarium is sharing their findings with the global veterinary community, elevating the level of care and welfare of whales and dolphins in both zoological facilities and the wild. But what is it about whales and dolphins that made anesthesia previously impossible? What are these new cutting edge treatment methods? And how did the veterinary team pull off a historic procedure no one thought could be done? I'm KP, a marine biologist that specializes in marine mammals. I spent a large part of my career working with cetaceans, including beluga whales, and when I heard they were going to perform this procedure, I was incredibly nervous. A few months ago, the animal care team at Shed noticed a lump on the back of Kamalu's head and neck. A CT scan revealed this lump was caused by a large network of cysts that were growing near her blowhole. Shed made these CT scans and images of the procedure publicly available. So let's have a look. This is the head and neck area of Kamalu. One thing people don't often realize is that the forehead or the melon of a whale or a dolphin is not where their brain is. The melon is actually a fatty organ used to focus sound waves during echolocation. Like humans, their brains are encased inside the skull. Now the blue in these images is Kimalu's airway and blowhole. And this dark mass is the network of cysts. You can see how close these cysts were to her blowhole, potentially even pressing against the back of her skull. And they likely caused her a lot of pain. After reviewing the images, the animal care team quickly recognized that surgery was the best option. I imagine this was an incredibly difficult decision to make because there is an inherent risk to anesthesia, even in humans and that risk is magnified by the unique physiology of whales and dolphins. One reason anesthesia on whales and dolphins was previously un impossible? It was unpossible as well as it was impossible. It was unthinkable and impossible. One reason anesthesia on whales and dolphins was previously considered impossible is because of the way that their brain works. Anesthesia disrupts the communication between different parts of the brain, leading to a loss of consciousness and responsiveness. In humans, anesthesia doesn't disrupt our ability to breathe because it's an unconscious or an involuntary function of the human body. In other words, we don't have to think about taking a breath. We just do it naturally so we can do it in our sleep as well. But that's not the case for whales and dolphins. They are voluntary breathers, meaning that they don't have an automatic breathing reflex like humans which makes a lot of sense when you live in the water. You don't want to just accidentally take a breath under there. So they have to consciously control their breathing. They have to physically think about every single breath that they take. So while this makes sense for a normal healthy animal, you can see where it would be a problem for anesthesia. If they lose consciousness, which is what happens under anesthesia, they will stop breathing entirely. This means intubating these animals is an absolute necessity while under anesthesia because they won't breathe unless you breathe for them. That is complicated by a whale's anatomy. They can't be intubated through their blowhole, which you can think of almost like our nostrils. So for the same reason that we don't intubate humans through the nose either. Because of its shape and framework, there are sensitive structures in the blowhole that could be damaged like the phonic lips. The phonic lips are the structure that allows them to echolocate and to vocalize, which I talk about in this video on echolocation. Air pressure in the blowhole causes the phonic lips to slap each other like what happens when you let air out of a balloon. This means that they have to be intubated through their mouths, but that's also complicated. In humans, our mouths and nasal passages are both connected to our respiratory systems through our throats. But this is not the case for whales and dolphins. If we look at the CT scans, you can see that the blue airway is not connected to their mouth. Again, this is an adaptation to living in a fully aquatic environment. It's so that they can feed and socialize underwater without inhaling lungfuls of water. But if you can't intubate a whale through their blowhole and their mouth isn't connected to their respiratory system, what do you do? The solution to this problem is the structure called the goose beak. It is an evolutionarily modified larynx or voice box. 
It functions as sort of a specialized plug that separates the respiratory system and the digestive tracts. Whales can actually move this structure. Think of it almost like a switch on a train track that would connect the mouth to the respiratory tract. It is believed that the purpose of the goose beak is a sort of risk management or last resort mechanism that could potentially allow a cetacean to breathe through their mouth in case their blowhole is blocked or uh, obstructed by something, disease, something like that. And this actually has been documented in porpoises and dolphins. <clears throat> I don't know why I breathe like that. <gasps> I was thinking about the goose beak. So the breakthrough that allowed veterinarians to intubate whales and dolphins is that they learned how to manually shift the goose beak into the position that connects the mouth to the respiratory tract. This allows us to put the intubation tube down their mouth through the goose beak structure and breathe for the whale like a normal intubation. But intubation isn't the only challenge here. The team also had to insert an IV, which is incredibly difficult. Not that any of this was easy so far. Whales and dolphins, and beluga whales specifically, have a very thick layer of blubber that makes finding the veins next to impossible. Which is what I believe um, you see them doing here with an ultrasound. They're trying to locate Kamalu's veins. Kamalo's skin also needs to be kept wet to prevent serious problems like some skin issues. I also think they probably had to keep her a little bit warm, which might sound silly, but the main way that whales and dolphins thermoregulate, aside from the blubber layer that they have, is actually through movement. They are constantly moving and the contraction of those muscles generates heat, which is obviously something Kimalu couldn't do while under anesthesia. There are other challenges even after the cyst was successfully removed. For example, how do you keep the surgical site together? Obviously you can't wrap these animals in bandages because they're fully aquatic. If you've ever had surgery, you know that you typically can't take a bath for several weeks and you have to be careful when in the shower. So what do you do for a whale that needs to be in the water? You can see the innovation in this video. This blew my mind. Check out my reaction when I saw it for the first time on a recent live stream. So this is interesting. Hold on, I, sorry, I'm geeking out right now. Um, this is uh, the suture site, so this is the, they've already removed the mass, um, and I'm so interested as to like what kind of what is this? Like you know, this looks very different. Like how are they? Like that's how they're keeping the surgical site together, and that's so that's so interesting to me. I'm like I'm trying to figure out how you do that because obviously you can't wrap these animals in bandages, right? If you want to watch one of my streams, I usually go live Saturday nights at 5.30 Pacific, both here and on Twitch. There could maybe be a glue, but even that's going to be pretty affected. Um, this this woman over here, uh, there's so many, like, this is like, this is the A-list celebrity sighting if you work with whales and dolphins. Like, everyone who's anyone is in this room right now. In these videos released by Shed, you can see there were dozens of people performing dozens of tasks all at the same time. In addition to specialists from across the country, Kamalu was also surrounded by people who have likely worked with her for years and obviously care very deeply for her. When it came time to reverse anesthesia, these caretakers who have built up years of trust with Kamalu talked to her and played recordings of vocalizations from the rest of her pod. They also needed to get Kamalu to take her first breath and that, like everything else in this procedure, could be very tricky. The animal needs to be obviously a little bit sedate um, to remove that tube. We're never really awake when those tubes come out. That can be a bit of a traumatic experience, but the animal also needs to be awake enough to put their goose beak back, breathe out of their blowhole again. And if she doesn't take that breath within a, I'm sure they had a set amount of time, they have to reach in and reintubate the animal again. The animal care team accomplished all of this successfully. Kamalu woke up and you can see she is clearly breathing on her own. She still has a long recovery ahead of her. Currently, she is behind the scenes in a specially designed medical habitat where Shed's animal care team is working around the clock, 24 hours a day, monitoring her health and well-being. This process includes antibiotics, incision site care, pain medicine, and post-surgery nutrition. Like I said, anesthesia has inherent risks, even in humans, despite the fact that we have a lot of practice. According to the National Institutes of Health, approximately 300 million people worldwide undergo anesthesia and surgery every year. 
In the United States alone, around 40 million anesthetics are administered annually. Every time doctors perform that procedure, they build up knowledge, they get better at what they're doing, and they learn how to mitigate risks. Now we have information, knowledge, and innovations that can allow us to do this with whales and dolphins. Every person that was involved in this procedure can share that information with other organizations and other veterinarians and build up that collective knowledge. That includes rescue centers that treat wild cetaceans that strand because of injuries or illness. Typically, those types of injuries and illness are an automatic euthanasia for the animal. But maybe this changes things. It's also part of a growing trend. This study found that marine mammals in zoos and aquariums, including dolphins, now live two to three times longer than that of their wild counterparts. And all because of the incredible advances in animal welfare and how animal care and management practices have dramatically improved over the years. Just like how humans are experiencing longer lifespans thanks to advancements in healthcare and medicine. If you want to learn more, I've linked the study along with all of my sources down in the descriptions below.